We're excited to have Professors Leandra Hansen and David Schultz, both from Hamlin University, here to talk today about the legacy of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everyone is muted and your cameras are turned off. Please keep everything turned off for the duration of the program. If you run into any technical problems, please send a high priority email to me at Jennifer, uh, excuse me, at jcarter at mnbars.org. If you've joined today's program by phone, please also send me an email so that I can confirm your attendance. And finally, uh, if you are joining us today on YouTube and would like to receive CLE credit for this program, send me an email as well. The course has been approved for one standard credit. Our event code today is 328386. If you have any questions for the presenters, please post those questions in the Q&A in Zoom or in the live chat on YouTube. And now I will turn it over to Professor Hansen and Professor Schultz. Take it away. Thank you, Jennifer. I think Professor Schultz and I decided, we flipped a coin and decided that I would go first. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about Justice Ginsburg. I'm excited to be here. I wish I was seeing more people in person. It's always hard to do this without seeing your faces. Um, in any event, I know many of us have our own stories about what Justice Ginsburg's work meant to us. Um, for me, I think I went far too long in my legal career without really knowing her. And I am sometimes somewhat embarrassed by that. She was appointed to the high court when I was in college, and so surely we studied cases that she argued when I was in law school, uh, but we rarely cast those cases in the context of her life and the context of work. And so I completed law school and legal practice with really little awareness of Justice Ginsburg's life and legacy. I didn't really find her story until I was a new professor prepping a women in law course, and it was hard to um, as a young professor, a lawyer with young children and a husband who also practiced law to not read her, read about her and um, be inspired and relate and admire her. Um, her commentary on parenting um, about how it made both her and her husband Marty better at work and better um, that their work made them better parents certainly resonated. By all accounts, she was measured and quotable, a prolific writer, a patient teacher, uh, perhaps a bit of a workaholic known as a, a night owl um, who had an unwillingness to turn away from work, a rebellious legal mind still committed to civility in the practice um, and to persuasion and to bringing others along the journey with her. So I was inspired by her life and the ways in which as a young woman lawyer, I related to it, but also surprised to learn how many of the cases that I remembered from law school that she had touched without me realizing that she had touched those cases. And I remember thinking that in, in large part, her legacy was what made it possible for me to even have been to college and law school. And ironically, it made it possible without me even having paused to give her a thought. And so today, what I'd like to do in 20 minutes, it will be impossible to do justice to her remarkable legacy and to consider all that she meant to the bar, the community, or those who admired her. Um, it would be impossible to also give space to those who might question her impact on them. Um, and in many ways, I feel somewhat like it's impossible to match the community's knowledge about her. I'm sure many of you who have read the biographies and seen the biographies will know much of what I share with you today. Uh, but I've also noticed in the last few days, few weeks, a lot of myths and misinformation sort of circulating around, kind of logical jumps about what she must have stood for in order to be so beloved as a progressive icon. And so for the less familiar with her work, this will be a good introduction to some of why she has a legacy and what her legacy is, um, one that I wish I had had sooner. And for the more familiar of you, perhaps it'll be an opportunity to reflect on the context or reconsider the context of her work in constitutional law and as a way to set the stage for what comes next, which I'm sure we will hear about at great length from Professor Schultz during his piece. So my hope is that we can talk about her legacy as a litigator, as a jurist, and as a feminist. And in order to do that, I want to start kind of by setting the context. I think it's really important to understand 
why the cases that she tried in front of the court in the 70s were so important. And I'm going to call this section of the presentation 100 Years of No from the Supreme Court to Women. So 100 years of no constitutional protection, more before then, but I'm starting the 100 years in 1873 with Bradwell v. Illinois, because that's where most gender and law textbooks begin, is with Bradwell, Bradwell v. Illinois. And the way these cases that we're going to talk about were presented in my constitutional law class 20 years ago is not the same way that they're presented in the textbooks that I use to teach women in law. Um, so that's one reason I want to look at them just a little bit differently. But I also think it's important because Justice Ginsburg often told these stories. She always wanted to credit those other what she called way pavers, including Myra Bradwell and Belva Lockwood and others. So just a quick background on the Bradwell case. I find Myra Bradwell absolutely fascinating. Her life in many ways parallels that of Justice Ginsburg, uh, married to a lawyer, trying to be a lawyer <laughs> with a family. Um, and she was told by the state of Illinois that she couldn't practice law. Um, and while it's a super interesting case, I don't want to dive too far down that road, um, but she's told by the state of Illinois she can't practice law um, and first given one reason, then when she pushes, they say, no, it's because you're a woman and she takes that case to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, no, you're right. The state of Illinois can say that women can't practice law. So um, that happens in this case, Bradwell v. Illinois. And when we learn about Bradwell v. Illinois in constitutional law class, we learn it in the context of the Privileges and Immunities Clause, and it probably wouldn't even make it into any of these books if it weren't for the concurring opinion by um, Justice Bradley. So here's the concurring opinion in this case which sets the stage for our 100 years of no. Harmony is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent career from that of her husband. The paramount destiny and mission of the woman is to fill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. My favorite is always the reference to parenting as a benign um, office. I found it not to be so. Man is or should be woman's protector and defender, the natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex unfits it for the occupations of civil life. And we won't dwell on those quotes, but I think they sort of create the framework for what the Constitution and the Supreme Court is saying when states and the government make distinctions about what women are allowed to do versus what men are allowed to do. So in Bradwell v. Illinois, there is... Um, a no to law practice in Minor v. Happer said it's voting in Muller v. Oregon. It's limited work hours for women. They can't work more than a certain number of hours. In Gosart v. Cleary in 1948, it is a Michigan statute that says that women can't be bartenders unless their husbands own the bar. Uh, husbands or dads own the bar. Um, and in 1948 in Gosart v. Cleary is the first time that the court actually was asked, well, you know, what about the Equal Protection Clause? So these other cases, they were privileges and immunities. What about the Equal Protection Clause? Surely the Equal Protection Clause says, you know, that we have a right to be treated equally to other groups. And the court says, yeah, you know what, we're not going to preclude legislator, legislatures from drawing a sharp line between men and women. We're not in the position to cross-examine the Michigan legislature. And I think this case is important because 1948 is two years before Ruth Bader Ginsburg starts law school. So this is what the Supreme Court and the Constitution are telling her and her contemporaries, all nine of them, women at Harvard Law School in the mid 50s, um, that they, you know, <laughs> um, that the state can decide what to do. So at this same time that the Supreme Court is continually saying no, of course, legislation is changing and culture is changing. And there are nine women at Harvard Law School, um, 12 when she transfers to Columbia for her third year. Um, but at this time, when this is what's happening in the world, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is saying things like, a child should have two caring parents that share the joys and burdens of parenting. Terry Canefield, one of her biographers, called them a 90s family in the 1950s. She tells stories about them asking her at Harvard Law School, the dean asking her, why are you holding a seat that could have been occupied by a man? So these are the kinds of things that are circling around her home life, her work life, her career, um, as she is moving forward. And they set the stage, I think, for her personal life and for her dedication 
to what she does as a professor and a practitioner. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to skip ahead on my slides there. So 1873 is when we had the Bradwell case and it takes a hundred years. We're in the 1970s before the Supreme Court decides that the state can't make distinctions or they don't quite get to can't, but before we start analyzing again. And the reason that that happens is because of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who now is a professor and a practitioner who runs the Women's Law Project for the ACLU and who has begun to take cases to try to get the court to reconsider its approach to the Equal Protection Clause. And this is her legacy in front of the court on the screen. And I can't talk about all of the cases, and I'm sure that for the most part, those of you who practice have heard of or know most of them or have heard about them lately as we've begun to hear more and more about her legacy. Um, importantly, what I want to you know, kind of talk about, the two takeaways from her legacy with respect to the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, one is that she argued, except for the ones that say brief, where she wrote the briefs, she argued all of these cases and one additional case that didn't fit on this slide um, <laughs> before the Supreme Court. And all but one, Con v. Shevin, she won. Um, and all of those cases took a step-by-step -step approach to the Equal Protection Clause. So we know that what we learned in law school about the Equal Protection Clause is that a state a government agency has to have a rational basis, right, <laughs> to, to um, make a distinction between the sexes. The first time the court decided that the state had to have a rational basis to make a distinction between men and women was in the Reed case. That wasn't quite enough for Justice Ginsburg, then lawyer Ginsburg. What she was looking for, um, what the movement, what she wanted for her movement was to increase the standard of review and to have those questions looked at more strictly. She wanted and requested in the Frontiero case strict scrutiny. Um, the court declined to do that. The Frontiero case is an interesting one. I think Professor Schultz is going to talk about it as well. Um, it's one that I think is interesting for a variety of reasons and important because it was the first time that um, strict scrutiny was really discussed by the court. So the court declined, uh, but four justices concurred. So it kind of moved the ball in terms of how closely we were going to look at cases um, that involved distinctions between men and women. Um, the case that ultimately increased the scrutiny was one for which she wrote the brief called Craig v. Boren. Craig v. Boren, Ruth Bader Ginsburg later called and showed her wit off a little bit, a frothy case that secured the right of thirsty Oklahoma boys to buy beer at the honk and holler at the same age as girls. So a case that when she talked about it later, she did not um, necessarily think had the kind of seriousness that they had hoped for in securing the intermediate scrutiny, but happy to have had the intermediate scrutiny. And the reason that it ended up being the Craig v. Boren case, um, so Oklahoma, in Oklahoma at the time, girls could buy 3-2 beer when they were 18. Um, I'm from Montana, so I know what 3-2 beer is. <laughs> but boys could buy it at 21 and girls could buy it at 18. And after Craig v. Boren, everybody could get their 3-2 beer um, at the younger age. So in any event, that is the case that got us this heightened scrutiny. It became for litigator Ginsburg a um, a full circle when she, I keep clicking in the wrong spot, when she reached the Supreme Court. So she was appointed in 1993. In 1996, one of the majority opinions that she wrote was in the case of United States versus Virginia. United States versus Virginia was the case um, arguing that the Virginia Military Institute should allow women 
um, because at that point, the Virginia Military Institute only allowed men. She wrote the majority opinion saying that indeed it should allow women, that it was not enough to have an equivalent school for women because there was no such thing. And in this case, in her opinion, she changed the standard of review to an exceedingly persuasive justification. And all of these cases, again, are cases that I, I knew about in terms of their um, connection to the standard of review for the 14th Amendment or for the Equal Protection Clause, and it, um, but not for their connection to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so that is, I think, one of her legacies, of course, her primary legacy that I'm always surprised that more uh, people, lawyers, don't know. The other takeaway from all of her cases is the fact that, and I'm sure many of you have heard this recently if you didn't know it already, the I, um, all of the cases, not all, most of the cases in the slide before um, had male plaintiffs. In other words, they were cases that secured the rights for women um, by using men <laughs> as plaintiffs. And this is really where I want to talk just for a moment um, about her approach from a feminist lens, because it's not without its critics, right? The first time I heard, in fact, that equal protection for women was guaranteed in the Constitution based on cases that secured rights for men, I thought, well, isn't that about right? Um, and so there was this kind of idea that, you know, why have the male plaintiff? So this is what Ruth Bader Ginsburg said about it. The notion was that women's rights is not something that just women should do. The issue really was the equal stature of men and women before the law. And it was my strong belief that unless men got involved, this wasn't going any place fast. What we were trying to show was that arbitrary differentials based on sex hurt everybody. So there is some criticism um, from different feminist circles about this idea of formal equality um, and that this position really has the face of formal equality, which basically just means always treat men and women equally, no matter the different situations or circumstances, formal equality is really about that. Um, but there are scholars and biographers, um, including her biographer, Wendy Williams, who have written a couple different things about that. One, that there were cases with female plaintiffs as well. It was just these male plaintiffs cases that managed to be before the Supreme Court, and that it was really for Justice Ginsburg about not pigeonholing people into stereotypes, that men would be as good at caretaking as women or could be, um, and that women could be as good in the workplace, um, and that she didn't like the idea of this sex role stereotyping. And so a lot of that comes from kind of a background uh, of hers where she spent some time in Sweden, where she was seeing that they were far ahead of the United States in terms of understanding um, that these kind of preconceived notions of the role of women and men that was so eloquently stated back in the Bradwell case uh, were stereotypes that were harmful. And so it's really very much an anti-stereotyping approach. I think we also have to talk about her contributions to reproductive rights. So I hear, especially from the non-lawyer crowd, a lot of misinformation or mistake about her role with respect to reproductive rights and cases that she might have supported. Um, the, Uh, just a lot of sort of mistaken assumptions about her her role in reproductive rights. Um, but she gave this testimony in her Senate hearing when she was appointed to the bench in 1993, saying that the decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life. So she did have a case um, in around the same time as Roe v. Wade, the Strzok case. Susan Strzok, the plaintiff, was an Air Force captain, and she got pregnant while serving in Vietnam. She was told that she would either have to leave the Air Force or she would have to have an abortion at the base hospital. Um, and she said she didn't want to do that because of her religion. She wanted to use her vacation days, give birth, and then give the baby up for adoption. Um, and so that case did not make it to the Supreme Court because the Air Force changed its policy. Um, but she uses that case a lot to talk about her approach to reproductive rights maybe would have been different than the Roe v. Wade case, where 
um, abortion rights were couched in a right to privacy framework instead of an equality framework. And she uses that case um, from the other side um, as an example of if we thought about it in terms of equality and the decision of when to have or not have a child being part of an equality framework, that maybe that would have been an easier route. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the jurist, is known for a lot of dissents, um, but it's important to note that the framework of her jurisprudence was not really dissent oriented until later in her career, and that earlier in her term, she was known as more of a moderate jurist who um, was very pragmatic and focused on following precedent, very committed to the independence of the judiciary, and in my view, very much a champion of the role of the justices. So always giving kind around disagreement, always focusing on how dissents made her opinions better, and she hoped vice versa. Um, but the dissenting that started later, around 2006, 2007, according to scholars, has kind of two um, Kickstarters. One is that she found herself the only woman on the court, which seemed strange for the time. So when Justice O'Connor retired in 06 and was replaced by Justice Alito, that left Justice Ginsburg as the only woman of nine in the early 2000s, which seemed strange and also put her in a bit of a different position than she had been in before. Um, and also it was becoming a more conservative court with slightly more um, decisions that were more focused on ideals of equality that she had been working on in her career. And I can't talk about all of the notable dissents, um, but there are some on the screen. I think everyone kind of has their favorite notable Justice Ginsburg dissent. Um, but Gonzalez versus Carhartt was probably the first, and Shelby County versus Holder, which was about the Voting Rights Act, um, the first to get really fiery, I guess I should say. Um, it was a fiery dissent, as described by many scholars and viewers. Um, in any event, the Shelby County v. Holder case was one that probably kick-started her, we can call it memification as the notorious RBG, because it had such wonderful quotes in it as throwing out preclearance when it's working is like throwing away your umbrella because you're not getting wet. And of course, her dissent in the Hobby Lobby case also got a lot of um, support and people found, um, I think, some comfort in her dissents in those cases. What about on other issues? I think it's really important to, oops, what have I done? Well, I did something, there's only two slides left, so we won't worry about it too much, but um, to look at other issues and to note that there are activists and civil rights lawyers um, in other areas who may have a different take on her jurisprudence. Um, the article at the bottom of this slide is a good collection of quotes from activists and civil rights lawyers that paints a picture of a slightly less consistent jurisprudence. Um, certainly a champion of these other issues, but in a more pragmatic and an inconsistent way. Um, so issues of tribal sovereignty were an area um, where people expected or had hoped for more support from the justice. Um, and certainly there were issues with criminal justice and other things where her approach was more pragmatic than in the equality area. And then finally, of course, she was the first woman to lie in state um, recently. And I kind of wanted to end there just with that note of reverence and respect and remembrance of her. Um, and this quote that I just happened to see someone else um, using today about her approach being neither liberal nor conservative, but rather rooted in a democratic society. So I went a little over time. Professor Schultz gave me permission to go a little bit over time and I talked really fast. So I'm gonna look at the Q&A while he's doing his part. And if there are questions that we can dive into, we can do that when we get to the um, Q&A at the end. Great, okay, thank you very much. Now, I don't have a PowerPoint. 
um, as I kid with people and say, I think I can sufficiently bore people with, um, um, with just talking. But what I want to do are three things today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, again, some of way of the thinking about her in terms of her legacy um, um, on, on the court. And I'm going to highlight a few decisions. I also want to talk briefly about where she fits into sort of second wave um, um, feminism, because I think it's pretty critical. You're probably hearing a dog barking next door, so I apologize for that. Um, but then I really want to put my focus on talking about um, the confirmation process, because in replacing her, and this is going to be, I think, tremendously important to think about. But the other way I want to preface the talk here, I know all of us have our stories about, about how we, you know, connect to Justice Ginsburg. And some of you may have seen a story um, in the news about a letter that I had from Justice Ginsburg. And I really want to sort of talk about that just for a minute here before I get into my other items here is that back in the early 90s, I was teaching a constitutional law class and a student asked an incredibly good question one day. And the question was, well, how long does it take for Supreme Court justices to, to issue opinions after oral arguments? And are there some justices who are quicker than others or faster than others? And I said, I don't know, let me do some research. This is in the early to mid, I actually think the late 90s. And I had three terms in a row where the Supreme Court justices hadn't turned around. So I had basically a three year study that I could look at. And what I did was to look at the oral arguments for all cases that had been scheduled, look at when the cases were decided, and then look at who wrote the majority opinion and averaged it out. And what I found is that Justice Ginsburg was by far the fastest justice on the Supreme Court in terms of turning around opinions. In case you're wondering who was number two, it was Sandra Day O'Connor. So the two female justices far outstripped the males in terms of sort of turning the opinions around really quickly. So I wrote this piece up. It was just kind of a throwaway piece that appeared in the University of Minnesota's constitutional commentary. And I think it was called something like justice delayed, justice denied, the fastest justice in the East. And it had all of these kind of like trite, you know, pop culture references to it. I called her top gun, things like that. You know, just kind of a fun piece like that. I sent it, a copy of the article off to her with just a, a brief note that said, dear Justice Ginsburg, um, you might find this of interest, you know, respectfully, David Schultz, et cetera, et cetera. I never expected to hear from her. And about, I don't know, six weeks later, I got this wonderful letter back from Justice Ginsburg that thanked me for the piece, but the part that was so cute about it and so endearing or, um, about it was the fact that she said, your letter made my, or, uh, or rather my, my letter, or my article made my day. She said that both her daughter and her granddaughter um, remark about how she was like the slowest um, eater around. And then she says to me, says in the letter, that I now have something uh, I can use against them. And more importantly, she said, I'm glad to know that my slowness in eating is made up by um, you know, my, my rapidity or speed of my um, opinion production. And what amazed me about the letter was the fact that I heard back from her. I mean, I never ever expected her back from her. I should also mention part two of the letter was also very nice where she, she talked about why the other justices maybe don't quite match up to her speed, but was very, very nice about, about the whole process. And so that letter has been hanging in my office for many years. And I just like to tell that story about the fact that I was a nobody, you know, still a nobody, you know, 30 years ago, she didn't have to write back to me, but she did. And I thought that was really quite nice. And it gave me an insight into who she was as a person. But where I want to sort of start my talk here is to think about Justice Ginsburg in terms of the times or where she was. Now, some of you no doubt saw the movie On the Basis of Sex, which is a very good movie, uh, which really portrays sort of, you know, going to law school in the late 50s, early 1960s. But where I like to situate um, Justice Ginsburg in terms of sort of her legacy is along next to two other individuals, Betty Friedan, who is the author of The Feminine Mystique and Catherine McKinnon. And I mention this because you have the three of them who are, I think, um, three of the more significant, at least in my opinion, um, and influential um, women as part of what second generation feminism in America. You know, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique um, 
almost an ancient history book now, hugely was important and influential in terms of thinking about, let's say, the civil rights movement for women. Um, you have clearly Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as law professor at, at Rutgers Newark, um, um, forming basically one of the first classes in the country that focuses on, again, using the term of the day, on sex and on women in the law. Um, I mean, I did my master's at Rutgers um, and, and even in, in, in the 80s, and her legacy was still quite significant in terms of the shadow she cast. Uh, but, but the point was, is that prior to, prior to Ginsburg, we wouldn't have found a class in the country that looked at the perspective of the law from how the constitution or the law really affects women. And her clinic, her classes at Rutgers really start to get lawyers and practitioners and professors to realize and say, maybe the law is not gender neutral. Maybe in fact, the law does reflect a particular perspective or bias and that perhaps one of the things that Ginsburg was able to do, and Leandra pointed this out so well in the cases that she, uh, in the cases that Ginsburg brought, um, is to start to get the, 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 the courts to think about the assumptions, the biases, the perspectives that the law had built into it, and to realize that the law was not gender neutral, but that in fact, it reflected a gender bias, or again, to use the language of the day, um, a sex bias in terms of how it looked. So I wanna say, and we forget about this, she invents in many ways, the field of what? The field of looking at women in the law, and both from a law school perspective, and again, in my other hat as a professor of political science um, who, that looks at the courts um, as a political institution, she was hugely influential in those areas. But she comes along with Betty Friedan and also I'm gonna say with Catherine McKinnon. Catherine McKinnon's famous book um, in the late 70s, The Sexual Harassment of Working Women, um, was hugely influential um, in, in convincing eventually the court in Meritor Savings versus Vincent in 1986, convincing him that what? Um, sexual harassment ought to be viewed as a violation of the 64, 1964 Civil Rights Act, that it was what? Sexual harassment was sexual discrimination. And so the three of them together, um, for Dan um, um, McKinnon and Ginsburg, are influential at a point in time of getting us to think about the law in a different way. And we shouldn't forget about that. Her, her accomplishment, Ginsburg, is both as litigator and then again on the Supreme Court. Now, I'm certainly not going to go through all the cases um, that Leandra did, um, or certainly go through the, the entire corpus of cases that Ginsburg did during her time on the court. Uh, there's just too many to cover. But there's three cases I do want to just underscore here. You know, one of them, again, was Frontier versus Richardson, you know, which is the case which we have to think about the context again. Again, this is a case that she's involved in as arguing um, or involved in as an ACLU attorney. You know, this is this is a case that's occurring 1973, uh, uh, an incredibly important year because 73 is the year of Roe versus Wade. Um, this is the year of what? The Equal Rights Amendment is working its way through, through, through the state ratification process. And what's important about the, the Frontiero case is they convince four justices not five, but four justices to say that, again, to use the language of the time, that sex is a suspect classification and that it ought to be treated um, no differently than race in terms of how we classify people. And this is pretty significant because had she gotten that fifth vote, um, race and sex, again, I prefer gender to use as a term, but race and sex would have been treated the same in the eyes of the law. And even though um, the court never accepted, never accepted as a fifth vote to treat sex that way, the court didn't get the fifth vote because several justices were saying that had the court 
um, ruled that sex was a suspect classification, it would essentially be doing what the ERA was meant to do, and they didn't want to preempt the political process from acting. Whether that would have been a preemption, whether um, saying sex was a suspect classification would have been equivalent to what the ERA was going to do is a matter of enormous debate um, out there. Uh, in fact, as a side, I've been doing lots of research on state ERAs, and this might be the basis for a whole different discussion on a different day um, for a CLE in terms of what we know about those state ERAs. But nonetheless, what I argue, what, what, what Frontier was important for, and again, Leandra was good on this, if she described it as saying that, that what, what, um, what Ginsburg was doing was about no's, about a lot of no's, what Ginsburg starts to do in her litigation, and what she does in this case, is to start to shift the presumption. If the presumption before Frontiero was that classifications under the Constitution based upon sex were presumptively okay, Frontiero shifts us to the argument of saying classifications based upon sex are presumptively unconstitutional. That is a huge shift, as all of us, all of us know, in terms of burdens of proof, burdens of persuasion, and that's important. Okay. The second case I want to briefly note that I think is significant is Harris versus Forklift Systems. It's a 1993 Supreme Court case, and why it's important is how it builds upon the law of sexual harassment law and also about changing presumptions. When the Supreme Court in, in Meritor Savings versus Vinson ruled that sexual harassment was, was a form of, of, of sex discrimination and actionable under the 64 Civil Rights Law, um, a distinction was made in the law under sexual harass, or, or under sex discrimination. There were two types. One was quid pro quo, the other was hostile environment. Quid pro quo was the classic um, um, sleep with me um, if you want a promotion, if you want the job, if you don't want to be fired. You know, it's the what the classic um, exchange of sex for, for some type of job benefit or security. But the second was the, the hostile environment. Um, and it could be about what well, words, actions, um, um, creating a context or a setting um, that would be so, again, so hostile that it would rise to the level of discrimination. And after Meritor Savings, but before Harris versus Forklift Systems, the standard for determining whether a, a workplace um, rose to the level of a hostile environment was to look at it from the perspective of what? A reasonable man. And I do put that phrase man in there. All of us who went to law school know that the reason that at a certain time in our lives know that the reasonable man assumption is the basis of so much of tort law, of so, of so much of our framework of the law here. And, and, what, and what Ginsburg did in Harris versus Forklift Systems was to point out the fact that what? That the perceptions that men and women have about what is considered to be reasonable is different. Part of this is the legacy of maybe of another woman. It was Carol Gilligan's whose famous book um, in a different voice pointed out that the moral sensibilities of men and women are different um, and how they perceive the world may be different. And what Ginsburg points out is that what a quote reasonable man might perceive um, as as an as a okay acceptable workplace environment might be different from women. That what a quote reasonable guy maybe at that time working in a factory thinking that and there were cases about this before Harris Fork versus Forklift Systems about guys in let's say some workplaces thinking that yeah, it's okay to make comments about women's dress or appearance, or it might be okay to post this month's Playboy centerfold um, on the employee um, 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 bulletin board or something like that. This is just what, just kind of, I don't know, locker room talk, you know, that women should be able to figure out how to, you know, put up with or get along with it. Uh, Harris versus Forklift Systems changes the law. 
it changes it and says that we are not to look at it from a reasonable man's perspective, but from a reasonable victim's perspective, which means, of course, in sexual harassment, sex discrimination, when 98% of the cases are male on female, we would be looking at it from a female perspective. Again, changing the law and getting us to think about it, what it means from a woman's perspective. The third, and by the way, she didn't write the opinion. It was Justice O'Connor who wrote the opinion, but nonetheless, you could feel and sense the influence that, that Ginsburg had. The last one is also not a case of hers, but the influence she had on it was tremendous. It's Safford versus Reddy, a 2009 case. And it was at a time when she was the only justice on the Supreme Court. And it's a really quite disgusting case. It involves a situation where there was a 13 year old young woman who was experiencing menstrual cramps um, and she brought the school, I can't remember if it was um, Advil, an ibuprofen or Midol or whatever it was. Um, and the school had a policy against bringing non-prescription drugs in. And I, if I remember correctly, she had shared maybe even one of the, uh, the, the ibuprofens with one of her classmates who was also experiencing menstrual cramps. And the school heard about it. The male principal who was older ordered her into her office, ordered her to disrobe down to her bra and panties as part of a strip search. And then, and again, you won't, I can sort of do it here, but you won't see it here, ordered her um, to open up the cups of her bra so he could peer in to make sure there was no, no um, 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 ibuprofen there, then asked her to kind of pull at the bottom of her panties to make sure that she hadn't stuffed any, any of the ibuprofen down her panties and wanted to see if they would fall out. Now, I don't know about you, I think that's deplorable action, absolutely deplorable action. Case works by the principal. So she, so Safford, so rather Redding sues. Redding sues, Savannah Redding sues, claiming it's an illegal search, that this is a violation of her, of her, of her, of her civil rights. Um, and it gets to the Supreme Court. And initially, during oral arguments, the Supreme Court, her eight male colleagues are dismissive of it. Um, at one point, what is it, even Justice Breyer um, said he had a hard time understanding how this young woman's rights have been violated. Uh, it looks like she's going to lose the case. She goes on with an interview with USA Today, that is Justice Ginsburg, and says, among other things, that, uh, that the, her colleagues didn't understand, again, her words, what it was like to be a 13-year-old girl. They didn't understand the dynamics, the power dynamics of being a 13-year-old young woman standing there in a bra and panties um, as a older male principal um, um, is, is, is doing what he did, et cetera, et cetera. And what wound up happening, she shamed the court. She shamed her colleagues into what? Into ruling in favor um, of this young woman. But think about what it took. It wasn't the oral arguments. It was what? She had to go on essentially national media um, to get them to realize a different perspective. And I think that's an important case that gets overlooked in terms of the imp impact that she had. And of course, when we think about how she eventually became a almost media star, you know, the notorious, you know, RBG, it's cases like this that do it. All right, so those are my three cases. But now moving forward, just to briefly talk about it here, so we leave time for Q&A here. We do have a confirmation process. The confirmation process is essentially outlined in Article 2 and Article 3 of the Constitution. We know that the president has the authority to be able to nominate to fill vacancies to the Supreme Court and lower federal courts, subject to what the official phrase is, is advice and consent of the U.S. Senate that if we were doing a larger discussion of, of the confirmation process, what we would point out is that prior to Robert Bork nomination in 1987, the confirmation processes were usually relatively sleepy affairs, didn't attract a lot of media attention, certainly didn't attract a lot of television attention. But the Robert Bork hearings back then 
where the perception was that that replacing what Justice Powell, if I remember correctly, with Robert Bork would switch the balance of the court, brought out an intensity of, of, of interest groups in media attention. Um, and it became important because eventually what we knew during the hearing is that Robert Bork answered the questions from the Senate. He engaged in long discussions about his judicial philosophy, trying to convince the senators, including people like Joe Biden, um, that, that in fact, he wasn't on the wrong side of history when he talked about how um, um, the Supreme Court shouldn't have decided Brown versus the Board of Education the way it was, or that at one point he had written and argued that the 64 Civil Rights Act should be ruled as unconstitutional or argued that perhaps Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided. He gets rejected, but it creates a firestorm, a paradigm. Four years later, there's the Clarence Thomas hearings uh, involving Anita Hill, where the allegations of him sexually harassing Anita Hill really sort of charged, charged the hearing. And then in 2016, with, in February of that year, Anton Scalia passes away. Um, Barack Obama appoints Merrick Garland and Mitch McConnell declares and says that we will fill no confirmations during the presidential election year and that instead uh, we should let the elections occur before the any nominations um, are, are occur, basically occur, or basically let the next president decide it. I mention all of this because we have what, going back to the 1980s, nearly what, a 30 or so year um, um, conflict over the court. We know that for over 50 years, dating back to the Warren Court era, conservatives and Republicans have wanted to flip the court. They have viewed, for rightly for wrong, and we can decide it, let you folks decide that, that the Warren Court went too far that it had what legislated from the bench, that it had, had gone in a direction that shouldn't occur. And there's been a 50 year effort to try to try to move the court in a different direction. And when Justice Roberts was put on the court back in the early 2000s, many conservatives thought this is really the flipping of the court. When then we saw Trump put on Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. The conservatives and Republicans were convinced this is now a solidly what? Perhaps 5-4 conservative judiciary. But in the Obama um, Care or Affordable Care Act decision from a few years ago, in a notable abortion case earlier this year, Justice or Chief Justice Roberts didn't vote with the conservatives angering many, believing that what, that he really wasn't with them. So when now Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, this was viewed as an enormous opportunity, an opportunity to switch the court from what some perceived to be what, a 4-1-4 court, four liberals, four conservatives, justice, our Chief Justice Roberts as swing to flipping it to being what, either either a 5-4 a um, conservative court or perhaps even 6-3. Even so this is the context. It is much like what? Also for some people, it is like when Clarence Thomas was appointed to replace Thurgood Marshall back in 91. Um, it was a move where some people said that it was an effort to replace one African-American who was very liberal with an African-American, very conservative. And again, without getting into the merits here, it is being viewed by some people similar to that. So this is the context, the context of the importance of how many people are viewing it. Now, how fast can it move? I need about two more minutes here. Um, there is no filibuster here. The Democrats cannot filibuster um, uh, the nomination. Um, um, Amy Coleman, can we bear it? Um, um, was confirmed, I think, what, the Seventh Circuit a couple of years ago, uh, went through um, somewhat closely, um, close, you know, with, with or somewhat contentiously, but, and Democrats were objecting. Um, I suspect that Democrats are going to ratchet up the heat. Um, 
the Democrats, if they want to be able to delay this, um, are going to need to get several votes. Remember, the Republicans have a 53-47 majority. For the Democrats to be able to delay this nomination, they need to get a total of four Republicans to say, we're not going to do the confirmation until, um, until let's say, the next president is selected at this point. Lisa Murkowski from Alaska has said she won't support going forward. Maybe Susan Collins, but it's not clear if she is, is, is committed on this. That becomes an interesting question here. Think about the political context also. Um, one of the elections that is occurring on November 3rd is, is involving Mark Kelly versus Mark, Martha, Martha McSally. McSally is the replacement for John McCain. This is technically a special election. Um, when Mark Kelly wins, he can what? Take office immediately, or if he wins, I'm just working out here, the polls are suggesting he's gonna possibly win this one. Most recent polls say a 10 point lead. So that's a possibility. Also, two members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, which are gonna hear the at least the initial um, testimony by Amy Comey Barrett, um, um, have been exposed to COVID, COVID virus and may not be able to, um, to vote in person. Earlier this year, both the House and the Senate rejected um, um, distance voting um, because of the, of the COVID. So they're gonna have to actually show up. And so we may have to see, see what the timing is. And now, of course, there's controversies emerging regarding whether or not um, um, Amy Comey Barrett um, was part of what the COVID supercluster that infected the president and whether or not this will affect um, her confirmation hearing, et cetera, et cetera. We also know, a couple of last thoughts here, a couple last there, that two years ago, the two years ago when, when Brett Kavanaugh was nominated, and then the revelations came out about the allegations of sexual um, assault against Dr. Ford, how that mobilized um, suburban women to vote in 2018. One wonders to what extent this now mobilizes again women, this confirmation hearing, the replacement by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, by Amy Comey Barrett motivates them for this election. And then finally, thinking about where the court is this year. Among the important cases this year um, are cases involving the constitutionality of, of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and there may very well be um, some cases about reproductive rights and LGBTQ issues coming down the line, all of which might have had a different result with a different justice such as Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay, so I've said my piece. We've got about, I think, five or six minutes um, in terms of hopefully taking Q&A here. So um, hopefully we've got room for some questions and answers or observations. So there were a couple questions um, in the Q&A, but I answered them already. One, just looking for a citation to your case, um, the Safford case, and I gave that. And then one about the Violence Against Women Act that I answered. I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, this one I think is for you, David, what does it take to build out the court or to expand on the court? I, that's actually something that's coming up a lot right now. What does it take to expand the size of the court? I think that's what's meant here. What does it take to build out the court? Okay. Okay. So remember the constitution does not prescribe a specific size or number of justices on the, on the Supreme court over time. I think at its most we got up to, I think, what, 10 justices at one point in the 19th century. I think it's been as few as like seven, maybe even a little bit less, but I can't remember now. But the point being is that um, all it would, if I say all it would take, it would take what, an act of Congress, which basically means what, both houses of Congress and the president signing off on, on, on doing something like that. Now, the last time there was a serious discussion about changing the size of the court or changing the composition of the court statutorily was in 1937. Franklin Roosevelt was incredibly frustrated that the Supreme Court um, was striking down what we, many of us call the first New Deal cases, cases about regulation of the economy. And he wins then the 1936 um, election by blowout proportions. 
1937, he gives the famous court packing speech. And it turns out that the conservative justices, the five conservative justices who were voting against him, if I remember correctly, are striking down the New Deal, were all over the age of 70. So he gets, goes on the national radio in a fireside chat and says, well, you know, the Supreme Court um, has a lot of important work to do. And, and, and some of the justices are getting a little bit old. And so he said, to help them out, I propose that we add one seat to the Supreme Court for every justice age 70 and older. Well, that's, of course, basically means what? We're going we're gonna to basically try to negate um, all, all the conservative justices by what? Adding five appointments that Franklin Roosevelt could fill. The, the public does not react well to what's called the court packing speech. But having said that, uh, Roosevelt may have lost the battle, but won the war. Um, that what happens is that um, one justice immediately retires, replaced, um, and suddenly the Supreme Court is now ruling five to four another way. And eventually Roosevelt is able to replace more justices. For those of you, and I never knew this for many years, there used to be an old expression called what? A switch in time saves nine. Um, apparently that's where that phrase came from. I used that phrase the other day in class and nobody knew what I was talking about. Um, but anyhow, I'm not sure how the American public would react today. And now we're a far more polarized society than we were then. There's many Democrats who are saying, well, yeah, what we should do at this point, if the Democrats win, win the Senate, we should re that is Democrats speaking, we should repeal the filibuster rule um, um, and therefore expand the size of the court and get even and, and add several slots to replace. Um, but that would be the way that you would have to do it. There's no more Q&A in the Q&A. We answered everything. All right, all right. I don't have any more questions from the YouTube link, but um, actually one more question just came in on the Q&A. Let's answer that and then we'll wrap up. Good. I think that's a question for you as well in your political science hat, Professor Schultz. What do you think about an 18 year term limit as okay, opposed so to the current term limit of forever? Okay, so now, um, we would have, to, if, if I, okay, regardless of what we're talking about here, okay, in terms of whether I like Ginsburg, dislike, like Amy Coleman Barrett, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, remember that the the length of term for the Supreme Court is in the Constitution. It's it's a lifetime appointment subject to to um, 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 good behavior. Now, I am not sure if the framers ever envisioned a situation where where justices might be serving for 30, like 30, I think 37 years is the record, I think if I remember correctly. Um, I mean, if I, if I were, if and we now know because of American society being so polarized that the Supreme Court is being asked to resolve some of the most contentious issues in our society and they're fundamentally not an elected body, which means it raises a whole bunch of concerns about democracy. If I were waving my magic wand, what I would like to see is actually a 10 year um, limit for Supreme Court justices um, of which then they could be reappointed. And the reason why I picked 10 years, that would outstrip two terms of any president. And so let's say for example, Donald Trump were to nominate Amy Comey Barrett, she gets confirmed, uh, she serves for 10 years. And then if in 10 years, whoever the president is wants to renominate her um, for another 10 years, and, and that president does, and the Senate reconfirms, that's perfectly okay. You know, many states have long terms, terms like that also. That's probably where I would go myself. We have one question that's come in from YouTube. Would it take a constitutional amendment to add terms for justices? It would, yeah. Anything we want to do at this point would require that. So whether it's age limitations, like let's say if someone's saying here like a mandatory retirement at 80 um, or term limits, all of that's going to require um, something approach, well, it's not approaching, it's going to require a constitutional amendment. 
but and but, and also someone pointed out that yes, uh, William Douglas was 37 years. So I, I think I got it right in terms of thinking it was 37. But the other thing to think about here, and then no, uh, this was a bigger topic in Minnesota a few years ago. Remember after the couple of uh, Minnesota Republican Party versus white cases, which were all about judicial elections. And and I say this because most of us are willing to say that probably the federal confirmation process is broken. You know that that it's politicized. Um, we're, we don't. We're not going to hear anything meaningful um, in this confirmation hearing in the same way that we rarely hear from any of them. But on the other hand, most of us, at least maybe not all of us, but many of us, don't find the idea of judicial elections um, something that's that many of us like, at least, again, I just express my own personal preferences here. Um, there needs to be a better way of selecting, I think, justices or judges in general. And this is a really tough, I think, um, policy question in terms of what do we do to come up with something? Looks like we have one more okay. question on turning the arguments to males rather than females. Um, do I think it was brilliant? Yes, I think it was a a brilliant move. I think one of the justice's strengths was her ability to read the room and make a persuasive case. Um, and there are lots of great quotes in all the biographies about her viewing her role as a teacher and what is the best way to explain something to someone is to make it relatable to them. And so I do think that that was helpful um, and part of the reason that those cases were won. Absolutely. I agree. Well, it is 5.04. Um, I think we should wrap things up. I want to thank our speakers today, Professor Schultz, Professor Hansen. Thank you both very much for a wonderful program.